Hi everyone and a massive welcome to AXA Arctic Live. It's fantastic to have you all with us for this Arctic Ask Me Anything session for primary schools. Thank you so much all for joining. We're talking to you live from the UK's Arctic Research Station. So we are up in the Arctic. We are in a small research science settlement called Nyolesund and that is on the island of Svalbard. So if you went about 750 miles behind me, you'd get to the top of Norway. You go about 750 miles this way, you get to the North Pole. We've got a great session today and we'll be going through as many of your questions as possible. But just to start off with, we have a little bit of housekeeping and also some shout outs uh, for some of those schools watching. So in terms of housekeeping, keep your questions coming. We've got 40 already, which is amazing. Uh, put those into the chat box to the side of the video player. Now, if as a teacher or other adults, you want to have the video full screen, you can always load the lesson again on a second device like a smartphone or tablet. With so many questions coming through, it's super, super important that we get some votes coming in and we don't have duplicate questions. So try not to ask the same question twice. And you can vote for questions by clicking on the thumbs up icon next to each question in the interaction app. Finally, if you do face any technical difficulties during the live lesson, there's a green uh, chat icon in the bottom right of each page of the Encounter EDU website. Click on that and you'll get through to support. And I hope that we can answer your questions and get you back on the right track as soon as possible. So it's my great delight to give you some shout outs. We have Cranford Park Academy in Hayes, London. Hi, Hi. to all the students there. Um, we have Amaya who's homeschooled and who's massively passionate about uh, polar marine life and all things polar and ocean. Um, Hi, Amaya. We have a big shout out to class three at St Giles on the Heath School. Hello, class three, big Arctic hi to all of you watching. And we have the Grange Primary School uh, in Bootle in Liverpool. So fantastic to have you all with us. And we have LGS Stonygate year four. And we have a Mrs. Jelly exclamation mark. So Mrs. Jelly, if you're right there, fantastic hi, to have you uh, with us. And this is a great uh, opportunity to welcome Ian to Arctic Live. Thank you so much uh, for, for coming on uh, and speaking to all the students. Uh, Ian, you, you're working uh, at the station, you're keeping us safe, you're making sure that everything works uh, for scientists up in the Arctic, but your career has spanned both polar regions. Before we dive into these questions, can you give us a sort of an overview of what you've been up to? Yeah, so I would like to say firstly hello and uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, yes, yeah, so I uh, started working for the British Antarctic Survey back in 2009 and uh, spent uh, a number of years working as a guide, uh, taking scientists out into remote places, glaciers, uh, out on boats and uh, sort of working everywhere from the polar plateau down to the uh, sub-Antarctic islands. I was also fortunate enough to winter, over winter three times. So my first trip to the Antarctic was actually for uh, two and a half years without coming home, which was uh, quite a long time. Um, since uh, 2015, I've started working more and more in the Arctic. And I used to work Antarctic summers and uh, Arctic summers. And uh, I think for about uh, eight or nine years, I didn't experience a winter season in either hemisphere. And uh, as of about uh, just over a year ago, I took up this position as uh, one of the Arctic station managers working up here in Yolesund and helping to deliver the UK's Arctic science research program. Amazing. So amazing wealth of polar experience in. Thank you so much. Um, we've got a stack of questions. We'll, we'll, we'll start just now. We've got from St Giles on the Heath. 
um, are wondering what is the coldest temperature in an Arctic winter? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, yes, so uh, the coldest temperature I've experienced is uh, is about minus uh, 28, 29 in the Arctic. Uh, it does drop to sort of closer to, well, the record temperature in Svalbard is down below minus 40. Uh, and that happened some number a number of years ago, but uh, it was not as cold this year. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, this is a, a huge question uh, coming up next, um, which is also for St. Giles, um, which is what is the most dangerous species in the Arctic? Well, it's very easy to say polar bears, but I'm going to say humans first. Humans are 100 percent the most uh the biggest threat anyway uh, in the Arctic. Uh, however, for us uh, working, it's yes, polar bears. So we uh, basically look out for them and uh, we're aware that we're in their terrain, in their domain, if you like, and uh, we have to treat it that way and uh, give them the respect they're due. Thank you so much. Um, we've, we've got a question um, in from LGS Stonygate. And, you know, obviously, you know, in the past couple of weeks, we've temperatures been down to minus 30 with the wind, quite chilly out there. Um, how many layers do you have to wear when you're outside? And then how do you wash them? How do you not smell too much? Well, yeah, so it's a good uh, a good question. It's probably got a number of different answers, but um, on a basic level, uh, we weigh, wear a layering system. Uh, so we go from sort of base thermals to mid layer uh, fleece type garments then to outer layers and then on our top half we'll quite often have outer down layers outer down jackets uh, and sometimes if we're snowmobiling we'll have a big suit that goes over everything and wow. the key thing about all the layers is that uh, you can shed a layer or two or put a layer or two on as the temperature dictates so rather than going out in one big heavy bulky layer, layer and actually being too hot all day or the opposite and being too cold all day with too few clothes, we can basically adjust our temperatures accordingly. Uh, in terms of the washing, we're actually very fortunate up here in the Arctic and we have a, uh, a washing machine on station. So it makes life le very luxurious and uh, we can avoid smelling, which is good uh, considering we have to live with other people on site. Um, however, I have been fortunate enough to spend uh, over three months living in a tent uh, with just one other person uh, with no washing facilities to speak of. And uh, there, what you tend to do is um, wash, boil, uh, melt some snow uh, to create the water and then use some soap and the water to wash your garments. And then you can hang them outside. And actually it's so cold that they freeze and they freeze solid. Uh, but that ice turns into a gas very quickly. It's called sublimation. And what you have is a frozen piece of clothing. And within a couple of hours, it's uh, clean-ish and good to use again. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Um, just imagine the sort of frozen clothes on, on your washing line from, from, from your tent there. Um, I love this question um, and it relates to, to what we've just uh, spoken about, uh, which is uh, what do you live in uh, and is it an igloo? And that's from LGS Stonygate as well. Yeah, so unfortunately it's not an igloo. I'd love to uh, have been fortunate enough to uh, build igloos and sleep overnight in them and uh, they're a fantastic uh, experience to have. Um, up here we are on the research station. So uh, as such, we live in beds uh, in a building. Uh, however, when we go out and do field work and if it's overnight, uh, we quite often use tents. And similarly, down in Antarctica, once you're away from the main research stations, you are camping uh, out in the field in these uh, what we call pyramid tents, a very, uh, very evocative sort of pyramid style tents, similar to the ones Scott used. I think thanks so much, Ian. Um, so not 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 so much the igloos these days. Not so much, unfortunately. Um, what this is from Amaya, and the question is: What animal have you not seen, but would like to see in the Arctic? And I'd love to know why as a follow up. Yeah, so it, <clears throat> so I've been uh, fortunate to see most uh, species that are commonly seen around Svalbard. Um, the uh, the one species I've not seen. Uh, is the narwhal. Uh, I think these are absolutely beautiful creatures, which is the main reason to see them. Uh, I've also been on a, uh, once when I was out on a ship up on the edge of the pack ice and uh, five people on the ship saw one. It surfaced briefly and then disappeared, never to be seen again. So I feel 
I've been very close to seeing one, which is another reason to see one. But uh, I've been very fortunate in that uh, between my work on land in the Arctic and the Antarctic, as well as my time at sea, I've uh, I've seen a lot of things and uh, and had the the luck to see most things I could see. And and f for for those watching, uh, what is a narwhal, and and why why do you why would you really love to see one? Yeah, so a narwhal is. Uh, uh, I'll have to be careful here because I'm not a biologist. It's a type of whale, um, but it's got a uh, a very uh, distinctive um, uh, tusk. But I think I believe it's actually a tooth that comes out of its uh, out of the front of its head, very similar to a unicorn. So it's kind of like a unicorn of the sea. Uh, and I still don't know if uh, it's 100% understood what the uh, tusk tooth is for. Um, my understanding is that it's actually quite sensitive. So I don't think it's for doing battle with other narwhal, and it may be actually something to do with communication. But uh, the big caveat is I'm not a biologist, so that might be untrue. Brilliant. Uh, thanks so much, Ian. Uh, I would love to see uh, a, a narwhal uh, too. Um, there's another question from Amaya, and relating to maybe your, your sort of three months sort of uh, deep field, I think you called it, uh, time when you're away from, from base, how, how long does it take to set up a camp when you when you get somewhere? So yeah, I think the probably simplest way to look at it is is it really depends on what the camp's for. So uh, sometimes we travel, uh, we call it a traveling project if you like, and uh, in doing so you'll maybe move from A to B, set up camp, and then the next day move from B to C. Uh, and in that case, um, you know you're just putting the tent up. And sort of setting up your basic living unit and that can take uh, you know roughly an hour to two hours each evening and then another hour to two hours to take it down in the morning and uh, naturally if you're doing multiple days of this uh, you get a lot slicker and you can sort of get that time down to an hour uh, however if you are staying in a fixed place like a more static camp uh, you start to make things a bit more luxurious for yourself and you put up your main tent and you have depot lines so that uh, you try and minimize how much uh, the your kit gets buried by the snow and uh, also you tend to put up a toilet tent if you're staying there for longer so you've got a bit more comfort <laughs> thank you so much I just think toilet tents you probably yeah but luckily it's cold enough that they don't smell too much normally, normally. <laughs> <laughs> there we go um i love this question um, this is from Oliver, and he's in year six at Higham Ferris Junior School and would like to know what time zone is the Arctic? It's a very good question because uh, essentially uh, the Arctic, as it goes, uh, you know, all the way around the world and it, uh, it covers uh, every, uh, every line of uh, longitude, um, it means that it covers every uh, time zone. Uh, so the easiest way to think about it is um, particularly if we're in the middle of the flat white nothingness uh, as I have been um, you end up slipping into what's called the solar day and that you basically work in the time zone that gives you the most warmth so when the sun is highest in the sky and you sort of revert to that local solar noon so similarly if you're traveling around the continent your sort of day will tend to shift so that you're not working in the coldest part of the day. Amazing. And and how does that work, even if when you have sort of 24-hour darkness, light, how, how, how does that work? So, yeah, the 24-hour, certainly in, in summer, you get the 24-hour daylight, uh, but the sun uh, does rise and fall, even though it doesn't go below the horizon. So, basically, you still have points where it's higher in the sky and other points where it's lower. And actually, the lower points are far more beautiful just because you get a much more orange light. Uh, but they are colder. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, we have um, for a question, and I'm just going to talk to Ellie, who's behind the camera. There's a question about what the view from our window is like, and I don't know whether it's possible to get a view from our window, but tell, tell me when that's ready, and then we can, we can talk a little bit about what we can see. Um, this is from, from Alfie um, in Ormskirk, West End. Um, who would like to know how long does it take to reach the Arctic from your home? What is the journey like? And how different is it from home when you get here? Okay, so um, <clears throat> certainly to reach the, uh, the part of the Arctic that I'm currently in, the New Orleans, uh, it can be anything from sort of two to three days, 
uh, depending on the flights, and it involves some overnights. Uh, I myself live in uh, the north of Scotland, so some may say it's not that different to uh, to the Arctic. But uh, certainly in terms of uh, scenery, the uh, Scotland is a lot greener. So it's always um, really, really amazing to get to the Arctic because uh, it's. I love snowy landscapes, but equally so, going home is just as brilliant because you 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 do really miss the greenery in your life. So it's really nice to go home as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, what is, uh, sorry, um, when the sun rises in the summer, we've been talking about these different seasons up here, is it hot enough to get sunburnt? I mean, it's quite cold, but can you still get sunburnt in the Arctic? And that's from St. Giles on the Heath. Yeah, yeah, certainly uh, the sun, uh, it's, uh, sunburn's probably not, the best way to look at it is it's not directly related to how hot it is. It's more related just to the amount of solar radiation your skin is receiving. So uh, to that end, it is very, I can testify, it's very easy to get sunburn in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. Uh, and actually, the uh, station I was at in Antarctica, uh, rather a research station, it was on the peninsula. And as such, it was under uh, what remains of the ozone uh, hole, uh, the hole in the ozone layer. And that means that actually you get uh, the, the, the time it takes to get sunburn is significantly high, uh, quicker. So actually within five or 10 minutes, you can start to burn. So uh, wow. always very important to, uh, to, to be aware of that. Even though it feels cold, you can burn and to uh, use sun cream uh, and reapply appropriately. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just coming through the questions here, seeing, seeing which ones we have already answered. Um, have we done food? There's a few questions about food. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, how, how how do we eat um, up here? And is it different from other times you spent in the polar regions? Yeah, so um, once again, we're sort of, uh, we're on the research station. So generally when you're at a base, uh, you have sort of communal cooking. Uh, that's here, we've got an amazing team of uh, Norwegian chefs that produce uh, food. Uh, generally a cereal style breakfast, but then cooked lunch and dinner. Um, uh, but just in case you think that makes it sound all too uh, comfort, luxurious and uh, appealing, uh, when you're living out in the field or on field camps, um, uh, the diet's a lot simpler. And a large part of that is due to the weight. So you can't uh, transport either by air or skidoo vast amounts of cargo. So your default is to use dehydrated food, which uh, my first, uh, I think, uh, three-month project, we had three different flavors of dehydrated food. So you can imagine, uh, you, you take along condiments such as uh, pepper and Tabasco sauce just to make them taste different. But you can imagine how boring that gets after a three-month period. So I'm very much appreciating being on a station at the minute. Did, did you ever have a favorite from the dehydration, de dehydrated ration, sort of boil, yeah. you know, just add water? I did actually. Um, it was the out of date pasta carbonara, which they no longer did, and they were like gold dust. So if you came across one in a depot somewhere in the middle of Antarctica, you'd always put it in your rucksack for a rainy day. <laughs> there you go. Spaghetti carbonara, absolutely brilliant. Um, so we've got a question here um, is uh, what do we both do to reduce our personal carbon footprint? A very good question, and uh, something I need to address more in my life, I'll be honest. Um, What's amazing about uh, coming to these places is, uh, well, and supporting science here is the chance to see them. But I am more than aware that even just by traveling to these uh, regions and doing science, uh, you have to kind of understand that you are part of the problem. You're part of the impact. And I'll certainly admit that within myself, it has uh, caused me to sometimes doubt my decisions uh, about coming to these places. Um, so to that end, I am, it's probably a work in progress, uh, and has been over the last year as, uh, yeah, I'm basically very aware of my footprint and trying to work out how to deal with it appropriately. Are, are there things that you'd, you'd like to do or you're reflecting on in particular? Uh, it's not so much, uh, uh it's hard to answer that. I think, uh, straight away, I thought an obvious default would be to, to to sort of plant trees, but I don't think that's necessarily the uh, uh, answer. Um, but I think, uh, you know, just looking at how we do things on the station, how we manage things on the station and trying to reduce our impact in that way, I think is a big part of it. Um, 
there's certainly some science that needs a presence in the Arctic, um, but it's just balancing up that uh, uh, the sort of justification to come up here for science versus actually, do you need to be here for science um, and such like. So it's uh, I think it's not a simple question, and it's certainly one that's uh, that's caused me to sort of uh, think more about how I uh, how I do uh, do this job. And that's just my professional life. So my personal life, I sort of, uh, you know, back in the UK, it's very easy to be greener and think more about things. But in the working life, it's the big part is the flying up to the Arctic, the travel, I think. So. Yeah, definitely. I think being here also also makes you reflect more <laughs> when when you because because because, you know, climate change can seem very like a just a sort of idea when if you're back back in the UK or, or in Europe, whereas here you can sort of see it. Yeah. You know, the glaciers retreating, yeah. the sort of less sea ice. I think, you know, very much like you sort of work work in progress. Um I cycled to work. Um we're cutting down on meat as a family. Uh you know, it's not ideal, but for each overseas trip we do for work, we pay into restoring some of the Caledonian forest yeah, yes. up in Scotland. And so I know there's a lot of difficulty over what are called offset schemes mm -hmm. where you pay someone to, you know, do something like plant trees to offset your carbon emissions, especially from flying. Uh, some of those have turned out not to be great. I think the BBC has just done a really good investigation of that. Mm -hmm. um, but if there is a local project, which is restoring a habitat, that's probably yeah. the closest yeah. um, you can get, but it, it, you know, it's, it's all a work in progress. Um, you know, renewable energy supplier i don't know about you at home yeah we, yeah. Yeah, we have some i think but uh, i think it's the main thing to say as well as is, is always keep asking the questions yeah. and, and put put people on the spot and yeah make them to try and uh, justify their actions i think is a good it's a good very very good question because it certainly i can't answer it straight so yeah. no really good thank you very much um we go from from that to uh a question from St. Giles on the Heath is how likely is it that someone could freeze to death in the Arctic? So <clears throat> temperature wise, it's very likely someone could freeze to death in the Arctic. Uh, hopefully we have enough safety measures in place uh, to stop that. Otherwise I wouldn't be doing my job. Uh, but certainly uh, currently with the sort of advent of modern clothing and modern sort of navigation techniques, as well as sort of uh, various devices that can help locate somebody, uh, in uh, in the event of an accident, um, make the idea the chances of freezing to death very unlikely. Uh, certainly, a lot less likely than it was a hundred years ago. And do communications play play a, a role in that? Uh, yes. So um, we have a, a number of ways to communicate here on station. <clears throat> we have uh, whenever anybody goes out uh, to do research, they take uh, radios with them, and uh, as well as normally a backup radio, and that way we can keep in communications with them. Uh, if you're going further afield, there are also on station satellite phones, and we also have in-reach uh, GPS devices, which uh, allow for sort of simple messaging, and they work, uh, the, the Iridiums and the uh, in-reaches work anywhere in the world, whereas VHFs for more local communication. So is that we've got this sort of VHF radio, which is almost sort of line of sight -y type yeah. stuff, so it works in the local area, and then these amazing global communications devices. Um, of course, we, we've, we've, um, we're coming to some polar bears. We mentioned polar bears um, before. Have you seen any polar bears and have they come a little bit too close for comfort? And what do you do if that happens? So um, I have been very, very lucky to see uh, polar bears on, on numerous occasions. Um, none this trip so far, but it's quite early to see polar bears uh, on, well, in our location. Uh, they tend to come uh, probably within the next month, we'll start to see polar bears. And then when they do, we'll be seeing them almost every day. Um, in terms of what we uh, do if we see them, uh, we sort of always work on the premise that yes, we are in their territory and we expect to see a polar bear uh, around every corner. And as long as you keep that in your mind, then you're sort of mentally prepared. Um, and we always uh, sort of, if we do come across a polar bear, the first thing is to try and sort of judge its behavior. So if it's in the distance and it's minding its own business and not coming anywhere close to us, um, we're in a fortunate position that we basically just need to retreat. 
Uh, however, if a bear does come closer, we carry flare pistols so we can fire warning shots. Uh, these are not designed to kill the bear, but they're designed to scare the bear off. Uh, but they're sort of uh, some of the measures we take. Um, but uh, yeah, ultimately, we just uh, we try and respect the fact that we're in their domain and we try and uh, uh, sort of respect that that sort of uh, side of things. Ian, I mean, that brilliant um, answer. It, ha, have you ever had to put that into practice or is it is a sort of a, a time when all these my the sort of the procedure i've thought of and i've planned in my head and i tell myself to do actually there's a time when you actually had to put that into practice uh it's quite an amusing story but not uh so i, I always as i'm walking around the tundra and through the glacial moraines i always try and play a game with myself in that what if I saw a polar bear now and from this direction and that direction and try and mentally go through the things I would do and, uh, and the order of things I do just to kind of practice for something that you can't really practice for. Um, but the one time I uh, have come across a polar bear or I thought it was a polar bear, I was I'm quite glad to say that I did everything I should have done and would have done, uh, but I was scouting ahead through moraines and I came across what's called dead ground. So it basically means you come across a ridge and the ground immediately in front of you is uh, unseen until you're actually at it. And I popped my head over and saw a polar bear asleep and uh, was relatively scared because um, it was only about 10 meters away. And so I popped down and managed to skirt around the hillside and come up again. And to my shock, there was two of them. Um, but then uh, when I came around again, I realized it was a, a dead reindeer. Um, <laughs> So I got a lot of relief from that, seeing it wasn't actually a polar bear, but I was quite pleased to know that uh, uh, all my sort of training uh, meant that I did the right thing when I came across one and I sort of retreated and uh, was sort of ready to, uh, and had radioed back to the rest of the group to say uh, where I was and what was happening. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, but great to hear uh, that all, all your thoughts and all those things that you've been going through your head kicked, in, yeah. kicked into practice. Uh, at the moment, uh, this question from Finn at Ormskirk, uh, West End Primary, uh, would like to know which Arctic creatures have you have we seen while we have been here? Okay, so we're still in the, I'd say, relatively early part of the season. It's uh, it's very much spring here. Uh, winter's uh, only just released its grip, really. When we first arrived, it was sort of minus 20. Uh, currently, it's between minus five and minus nine. So it's it's a lot warmer relatively. Um, and that means that more animals are coming back day by day. Um, in terms of what we have seen, uh, we've seen reindeer. Um, we've seen them a number of times. Uh, we have seen uh, the Arctic fox, and we actually have one that sort of uh, rustles around outside the building. Um, bird life is our main thing. So we have seen ptarmigan and we've seen snow buntings. And we've also seen the return of some of the geese uh, and the eider ducks, um, and uh, and as well as walrus, actually. We've seen walrus out in the bay, which was really nice. Um, but I think more and more each day, as each day passes, we'll see more and more of the bird life returning. And as I say, the polar bears should start coming over this side of Spitsbergen in, in, uh, within a month. So, so over whether we hunting hunting seal on the sea ice on the, on the east coast during the winter, is that where they are? Yeah, so <clears throat> if you can think of uh, sort of Spitsbergen is an island or Svalbard is a collection of islands. Yeah. We have uh, the the west side where we are is uh, relatively warm. I suppose similar to the Gulf Stream in the UK, uh, you get sort of a lot more of a, a warmer maritime climate, which means we get less sea ice. And the polar bears like sea ice uh, to sort of, uh, that is their main habitat. Uh, so actually in the winter time, you'll find more sea ice, uh, more polar bears and more sea ice over on the east side of uh, of Spitsbergen and Svalbard and actually it's a lot colder over there a lot drier and there's a few islands over there which are really um, uh, really common denning sites so where the the mother polar bear uh, sort of gives birth to her cubs uh, so um, over here they tend to migrate over to the west part of Spitsbergen in the summer months when the sea ice is starting to break up and uh, that's all largely driven by food and it's where they have more food available to them on the west side during the summer months than they do during the winter months. But thank you very much, Ian. Um, we we have um, F Grace, who, who's also from from Ormskirk, um, who'd like to know why did you want to explore the Arctic, or what what's drawn you to these cold, mm. icy parts of the world? 
Yeah, it's a. I don't know if I can really put a uh, an exact answer on it, but I will say that when I was uh, probably a similar age to you, when I was in primary school, I uh, we did a project on uh, well the race between Amundsen and Scott to the South Pole, and sort of uh, did some. Uh, writing and poetry and artwork around that to sort of do a wee display and uh, so set definitely every since then I've had a, a strong interest in the polar regions um, my background is actually as a scientist uh, I used to work as a as a research chemist um, but mountaineering and sort of travel well an exploratory sort of uh, travel was always my hobby and uh, to that end I applied to the British Antarctic Survey to work as a guide which was based on my mountaineering background rather than my science background. And uh, I'm very pleased to say that they hired me for some reason. And uh, and that's uh, what kept me, uh, what brought me here. And um, what kept me here is actually seeing the place with, with my own eyes. It's absolutely phenomenal. Brilliant, thank you very much, Ian. We've, we've got lots of, of questions, maybe because we'll whip, whip, whip through a few of them, but um, maximum height a polar bear can get to, and that's from Leo. Uh, so, Standing on its sort of hind legs. Standing on its hind legs, it'd be uh, way above my head, so probably uh, two meters. Depends on if it's a big male or a female, but uh, female would be slightly smaller, big male um, bigger, but both would be above my head, so probably around two meters, give or take. Wow, huge, huge. Biggest land carnival? Uh, I think technically it's classed as a sea. Um, well, I don't want to get technical on you, but I think it's actually classed. Ursus marinus is its Latin I name. Know. It's the uh, the marine bear. So, but uh, yes, it's the biggest bear certainly. Um, brilliant, um, Charlotte. Um, have we seen a walrus? Yes, we did the yeah. weekend mm -hmm. out and out out in the bay there on the sea ice. Oh, on not the sea ice, but on uh, an ice floe. Rather, sorry. Um, uh, this is great. Jacob would like to know: Have you ever been underwater scuba diving under the ice? Uh, so that's a really good question. Uh, I haven't personally, um, purely because uh, uh, the sort of uh, the rules that bass have are all designed around safety, and so recreational diving wasn't an option when I was in Antarctica. Um, but I have a lot of friends who have, and I've seen their videos. Uh, modern times means that uh, you can get brilliant underwater cameras and seeing people dive under the ice and uh, seeing the animals in winter time when it's cold and the sea can freeze it also coincides with when the water is at its clearest so you get some amazing uh, visibility and you can see for a long way under the ice and it's a really really uh, I it's the one thing that I wish I had done in Ant or wish I could do in Antarctica it's uh, it looks amazing brilliant um there's a great question here um which from Lucy hi Lucy um why should someone go to the Arctic and why did you decide to? I mean, it's so, similar, to, but it's got yeah. an edge to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the first part, why should someone go to the Arctic? Um, there's obviously a number of reasons. Uh, you know, if your scientific research brings you here, that's, uh, that's one. Um, tourism is another big one. Um, but tourism, I think, does have its place because uh, if you see the Arctic and educate yourself about the Arctic and uh, sort of really uh, get to see it firsthand. Uh, and then you can take that sort of knowledge back and describe it and uh, sort of use it in your day to day life. I think, you know, there's a big part of it that is that. I don't think the Arctic should be closed to just researchers or close to everyone. Um, the sad thing is that the Arctic is going. It's, uh, it's not going, but it's uh, it's melting. Um, and the more people that see that and can try and affect that and change that, uh, the better. Um, I certainly wouldn't uh, advocate coming up here to start mining for oil, drilling for oil. <laughs> That's the one thing I wouldn't come to the Arctic for. <laughs> and and in, in you you spent some time in in you know guiding tourists as, as well. Yeah. And and just as a follow up for that, just to sort of widen it out, did you see? Uh, people change because of the time they spent in the Arctic. Was a was a did you see a, was a transformation that you you could sense? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely one hundred percent. I wouldn't say uh, everybody I've been with, um, but there's definitely uh, you know a percentage of people on every trip I did that were changed. I think it depends a little bit. I had a, tri a trip to Greenland with some school teachers uh, a number of years ago, and I'd say every single one of those like came away with 
a hugely different appreciation and understanding of the region. Um, on my ship based work, it's probably harder to impact that just because the ratio of guide to uh, sort of tourist is higher. But yes, there's always people that uh, come away with it, uh, having had an amazing experience. And uh, it's always uh, really heartening to see uh, to see the change in some people. Some people are really humbled by the uh, both the Antarctic and the Arctic, just by the whole experience of the polar regions. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Ian. We've got some amazing things, uh, questions coming through. So we've got Alfie. Um, we have, what is your favourite thing to do in the Arctic? Um, I really like driving snowmobiles. That's uh, quite good fun. But uh, my favourite thing is probably, I very into my photography. And uh, the good thing about being into photography and visiting both the Antarctic and the Arctic is it's very hard to take a bad photograph. So you come away with a lot of photographs. So that's that's probably my favourite part of being up here. Uh, if if we find um, in the background your uh, website, should we share that so that <laughs> you're more than welcome to? <laughs> we'll try and get that that as an announcement uh, coming through. Um, Mrs. Curry would like to know hi mrs curry you would like hi. to know uh how do you get how do you do your shopping so we do have a shop here um northernmost shop in the world it probably is where it will be yeah. <laughs> everything else the northernmost so it will be the northernmost shop in the world um it's um it's uh it has a, a fair selection of uh of um souvenirs i suppose so like uh, flasks and water bottles and uh postcards uh, however we are living in a community and um, there are things that you need that aren't souvenirs so to that end the shop does have uh, a selection of sweets chocolates toiletries uh, basic sort of clothing and things like this so it's got it's got the sort of stuff we need um, however uh, we are not a million miles away from the real world and you can get things posted up to you if you've forgotten them Thank you very much. Um, and just on, on this sort of being a million miles away piece, um, Mrs. Forrest, hi, Mrs. Forrest, I would like to know how we get medical assistance. Yeah, another very, very good question. And it really uh, depends where you are. So where we are on this research station, uh, we have uh, a nurse, but we don't have any doctors. Um, if we were to become ill, uh, our first port of call would be to see the nurse. And if uh, she thought it was uh, uh, suitably serious, they would contact what's called the Susomaster, which is the governor of Svalbard. And they would uh, initiate a rescue helicopter to take you back to the hospital in Longyearbyen. And uh, Longyearbyen has uh, seven beds in its hospital, but it's still relatively basic. And if your uh, injury or illness was deemed serious enough, you'd actually get airlifted out to the main mainland to Tromso, where they have a full medical facility. And it's the similar in the Antarctic. So uh, if you're out in the deep field with just one of the scientists, you are each other's first point of contact in terms of medical care. And then we would then medevac you to the research station. In Antarctica, we do have doctors on site, but we have a very, very limited surgery. So once again, if it was serious, you would get medevaced out to either the Falkland Islands or to South America, to Punta Arenas. Yeah. Wow. So um, sometimes it can feel like we're quite near civilization. Other times it feels like it can be quite, yeah. quite remote. I think the big trouble is uh, it's very easy to talk about uh, a medivac as if it's just something that's done. But the big trouble is the weather. And so you might be waiting weeks for a weather window, particularly if you're somewhere remote. So, uh, so, so you know, serious, serious stuff. It sort of feels like with all this modern technology, yeah everything is safe but that weather comes in and you, you can be cut off from the outside world for quite some time uh life question this is from lgs stonygate and is do you do you play any sports here or, or, or do you play sports or are there sports played up in the arctic yeah so yep yeah, we uh <clears throat> it's uh there's a really sort of good uh community spirit if you like up in yorland and um to that end there's a thing called the welfare fund and that basically uh, provides money for various uh, forms of equipment or recreational uh, sort of stuff and it has a little bit of money put aside to uh, look after the cabins that are in the local area um, so we have a very good gym uh, small sports hall and for me personally a wee climbing wall that i can go on uh, but we also have some bikes on station that we can run uh, cycle around uh, within the community 
as well as uh, things like skis so you can get off station and go for a little ski uh, if you have the time brilliant thank you very much um we've got got five more minutes and uh only 25 more questions to get through so um i'm very sorry get voting um and i think if we can get the the questions that we've covered before um sort of remove them or be able to f focus um fully but are there insects in the arctic Yep, there are insects in the Arctic. Uh, I believe there's a bee, which I've never seen, but I believe there is a, a bee up in Svalbard. Uh, but certainly I've seen sort of smaller flies. Um, and we also get, I'm not sure if they're technically insects, but you get, <clears throat> we land sort of mites. Uh, and actually in Antarctica, uh, sorry to flip hemisphere, in Antarctica, the largest land predator is a, a wee mite that's about eight millimeters long. So, And I've been lucky enough to see one of them. And that was on the top of a mountain around 70 degrees south and it was cold and fairly inhospitable but there was lichen and a wee mite on the rocks so. <laughs> there we there we go largest largest carnivore that is yeah. brilliant um uh and maya would like to know um what can uh, she be doing now and it probably applies to a lot of those um students watching to become a polar biologist in the future but there are there is more more jobs in the polar region than, than being a scientist there is more jobs <clears throat> than being a scientist. So uh, obviously science is the reason why we are here. Uh, however, there is a, a need for operational and support staff. Um, in terms of what you can be doing right now, I think, you know, taking an interest in the region and uh, <clears throat> and just educating yourself on, on or, or through school as to what it's like to be here is a brilliant first step. Um, and I suppose, if you're uh, better than me and you know what you want to do at this age, you can <clears throat> start to think about what you'd like to sort of focus your studies on as you get older. But I know for one that uh, I'm 41 or two and uh, I still don't know entirely what I want to do. So um, try not to pigeon your host self in too much, but uh, uh, to one sort of discipline. But uh, I think to work in the polar regions, the interest in the polar regions is probably the key thing to have from an earlier age. Brilliant. Thank you, Ian. Um, we're going to so whip for a few, few. Have you seen the Northern Lights? I have, yes. Uh, what were they uh, like? They're all right. They're all right. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely phenomenal, really. I was up in February and uh, was fortunate enough to see them shooting overhead. And I'd only ever seen them from Scotland before, which is still amazing. But uh, no, they were something else up here. Really nice. Um, best memory uh, of your time in the Arctic? What do you think it's going to be? Best memory of my time in the Arctic, uh, probably uh, potentially the Northern Lights, but certainly uh, my first trip up in winter, seeing the sun return was really, really a lovely, lovely feeling. Uh, and uh, this follow up is, uh, what are you most proud of having achieved in, in the polar regions? Well, let's keep it. <laughs> um, I think probably, I don't think it's really a, a specific uh, point or moment, but just uh, some of the sort of scientific research that I've supported, particularly down in the Antarctic and uh, and as well as up in the Arctic, that is probably my sort of proudest moment, if you like. So I, um, I've been fortunate, as I say, to work with a number of different scientific disciplines and uh, through the British Antarctic Survey, some like world-class scientists. And uh, despite the fact of not being a scientist here, I still have a scientific background so therefore an interest and so you really get to understand the science and appreciate the impact it has and i think just being a footnote in their paper in having supported that is really 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 special um very sadly we only have time for one more question we're going to take a nice big open question here and it's from devon who is in year six at Hyam ferris junior school and would like to know how much of the arctic is still undiscovered so Probably very little of the Arctic uh, landmass is still undiscovered, uh, but every year the sea changes. Um, the sea moves around because it freezes. Um, so I'd say, it, it, and there's probably a lot of areas that haven't been visited, but the reason why I say undiscovered is uh, uh, is not undiscovered is probably because uh, Google Earth and other such satellite technologies means there's very, very few remote places left on Earth above the surface, but I'd say under the ice and, you know, the sea floor, it's as with everywhere on the planet, the sea floor is probably the, uh, the biggest undiscovered uh, sort of habitat area close to home that we know of. 
by a long way, actually. <clears throat> and in, I mean, you're you're now going to be working just down uh, the valley, as it were. Mm-hmm. On every day, there's going to be new undiscovered land as the glacier retreats. Yes, that's true as well. Yeah, and um, and to that end, you know, there's a lot of scientists. Uh, they work on uh, um, sort of mapping the glacier subglacially using radar. And because uh, one of the big things is as those glaciers retreat, how high is the ground underneath? And there's certainly a part of southern Spitsbergen that there's two glaciers that join and they're only 100 metres thick of ice. And actually, when they melt, which unfortunately will probably be uh, within the next sort of 40 to 50 years, um, they will probably form an island off the south of Spitsbergen. So instead of Spitsbergen being one island, there'll probably be a Spitsbergen and a south Spitsbergen. So. Wow. Well, the changes, your experience, uh, your um, encounter with a nearly polar bear. um, It's been amazing, Ian. Thank you so much uh, for being part of Arctic Live. Thank you also to all those students watching. A a phenomenal amount of amazing questions. Um, Some of us, which obviously put us on our spot and made us reflect on our time up here. And I hope uh, you have the opportunity to reflect too in the classroom. Uh, But for now, very sadly, this is the last uh, live lesson for Arctic Live uh, this year uh, on Encounter EDU. Do come back to us for World Ocean Day um, on the 8th of June. Um, But until the next time, it's goodbye from Arctic Live. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.